A lot of attention on Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She's from New York. Um, what do you think about Matthew in terms of when you hear what she's saying, do you feel like she speaks for you? No, absolutely not. Why not? Um, because the problem is, though, especially with the Democratic Party, a lot of them feel that they're entitled to any non-white vote that they can get, especially Latinos. And Latinos, of course, um, there's going to be 32 million uh, registered voters this year. Um, that's a lot. And to think that every all Hispanics think the same is just ridiculous. Um, People from Puerto Rico tend to vote more Democrat. People from Cuba, Venezuela tend to vote more Republican. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is because they understand what socialism is. They understand what the AOC and Bernie Sanders' socialist policies are to the highest extent. And obviously they don't want a repeat of that here in the United States. And I feel the exact same way. So we've gotten kind of in the weeds here in this discussion. We've heard talk about the value of this project, about energy rates. We've heard about the difference between AC and DC electricity. I don't care about any of that, to be honest. I don't care if the rate that this company would be providing would be five cents a kilowatt hour or negative five cents. I don't care if the tax revenue generated is $10,000 or enough to pay our entire budget for the next 20 generations. We had a debate the other day about carjacking. And while we had disagreements about that particular bill, there's one thing that most everyone seemed to agree on, and that's that you don't get to point a gun at someone and say, I want your stuff. And that's what this is. We're saying a private company can go to a private landowner and say, I'm going to use the power of government to take your land, and then I'm going to do something with it. And that's when I stop listening. Because I don't care what that something is. I don't care how great it is for society. I don't care if it's windmills or, or nuclear power or, or oil or corn. It doesn't matter. This is not a debate about the, the relative merits of the project. It's a debate about fundamental property rights. And at the end of the day, should this bill be broader? Should we have a big discussion about reforming eminent domain? Absolutely. I will support that, and I may very well file that bill next session. But the bill in front of us today is narrow. And we have the opportunity to save the property of a small group of people. I would like to do a lot more today. I can't. But what I can do is send a statement very loudly and very clearly that we will protect the property rights of the people of Missouri. I'm a foster parent. Me and my wife have been foster parents uh, for about six years or so. And we did our training in Baltimore, Maryland with an organization. And during our training one time, we had about four different families, four different couples there. And then there was this one um, couple, uh, bless her heart, uh, low income family, but has a big heart and wanted to help foster children. And she told a story about her daughter who graduated from high school and told her mom that she wanted to be out on her own. And this was in Baltimore. And she said, I was just so proud of my daughter. She graduated and everything. And, you know, in two weeks, you know, she was looking at apartments. And you know what? She even went, she knew exactly where to go get her energy assistance. And she knew where to go sign up for her food stamps. And my wife and I were like, what? We, we thought we were going to say, like, she knew where to go to start community college or to find a new job or something like that. But in their community, there was so much of a, an attitude of dependency on welfare that it created the system and the mindset where she was proud of her daughter for knowing where to sign up for wel welfare. If you see charity, you see philanthropy, you see programs like that that are able to walk alongside people to actually help them to rise up out of their situation, it is far more effective than any welfare program. Is today. It's a beautiful day in America. You know, we got 12 Young Americans for Liberty students headed to the White House. Something I'm pretty proud to say, you know, we're finally having an issue that we've kind of tackled for a long time, being free speech on campus. Really, I'm just glad that President Trump is shining a light on this issue. You know, we got arrested for handing out constitutions on a college campus. So to be waking up this morning um, knowing that we were going to be going to the White House to stand next to the President of the United States, as he told all the colleges across the country that you need to start upholding the Constitution and protecting civil liberties and students' rights, was, it was a great feeling. Today's groundbreaking action is the first in a series of steps to protect free speech on college campuses. 
got to see three of our activists up on the stage. You know, Trump comes in the room, and it's just a cool moment. You know, for Young Americans for Liberty, we're sitting here trying to trying to work day and night, trying to make sure our students are effective on campus, recruiting students, and to see Trump sit there talk about free speech, talk about it being a the issue that Young Americans are tackling. I mean, he's talking about YL. You know, he's talking about our efforts on campus. You know, I hope it's something we continue to do, which is have such an impact on the future of the country and the course and just the direction of where we're headed. And uh, I think, uh, you know, walking into the White House, being in that room, it's surreal. It's a, it's a cool moment for the organization. I mean, I'm not going to lie. It's, it's a great experience for me and for the activists and for the people that make it possible. But it's not about me. You know, it's about our, our students on the ground. But they realize how important liberty is. You know, they want to advance these ideas in their lifetime. And the thing I always will credit these YAL students with is they're going to go the extra mile. They're going to do what needs to be done to be effective activists. My name is Tahmina Dehbozurgi, and I am an immigrant from Iran. When I mention the name Iran, the first thing that comes to mind is oil, gas, wealth. And that's right. Well, Iran holds some of the largest oil reserves in the world. But the problem is, unfortunately, the government is in charge of extracting those resources and allocating the money into the budget. What happened here in 1979 was after the Islamic Revolution, the government kicked out all of the international and private investors in the oil and gas industry. When the government took control of the fundings, they failed to allocate that money properly so it could benefit the country. What happened was they used that money to subsidize a lot of unnecessary commodities and programs that eventually led to mass inflation. Right now what we face is sanctions against Iran's oil industry, which has caused a lot of problems for Iranian people. I am one of those individuals who was forced to leave the country because of economic calamities that hit my life. Right now in America, what we have is the ability to choose what we want to do. We have the right to decide what to wear, where to go. Well, these things do not exist for Iranian people anymore. And that's because the government has taken control of the natural blessing that belongs to all the people, but uses that money to go against the people themselves. Absolutely, gun control is racist. From its inception, from its creation, from its origin, the racist practice of gun control is older than America. When you got the Louisiana Purchase, where you got slave catches and black codes literally written out saying, if you run into Native Americans, melanated beings for lack of a better term, if they have something that looks like could be a weapon, you are within your means to kill them, that's racist. That's, that predates 1776, that, is, that happened, right? So then you got, okay, hey, we don't wanna f these slaves anymore. Cool white people, cool black people, cool Native Americans fight. Okay, we overturning this thing. At that time, every state is constitutional carry. Hold up, the blacks are now like citizens, so come up with extra rules. The origin of it, the expansion of it, you can fast forward to now. In the areas that people are disproportionately affected by gun control is black and brown people in America. We're not talking about dudes that like robbed and raped and killed. We're talking about people that just had the firearm. Now, I'm not one of these identity politics people, but at the same time, if you're talking about the numbers and the data, gun control disproportionately, negatively affects people of color in America. You know the thing that nobody wants to talk about? Gun control is the root of socialism. I said that, I'll say it again, it is. The root of socialism is gun control, taking power away from law-abiding citizens. Look at Venezuela. What did they do in 2012? They decided that citizens should not have the right to protect themselves, to defend themselves. And we can talk and we can act like this is all about some ability to hunt or to shoot or to play some game. Let's get down to it. This is about the ability to defend yourself from a tyrannical government and as citizens of the United States, we have a guaranteed right to defend ourselves, and we ought to stand up, we ought to be firm, we ought to be principled, and we ought to be blunt about it. The Second Amendment is not negotiable. I don't imagine, Emma, that it could have avoided their attention that we have the best jobs number that we've ever had in my entire lifetime. The fact that there are opportunities now to trade up. If you don't like your job, uh, it's not paying enough, yeah. you can trade up. If you, if you don't like the exact work you can do, you can change your careers entirely. We have a job market that allows that kind of freedom to happen mm -hmm. right now because we have less government, not more of it. 
Absolutely. And I don't think young people understand that the more the government gets out of the way, the more prosperous we're allowed to be. And so they see problems, to Stephanie's point, things like student loan debt and housing costs. And rather than seeing those as something that comes from the government, because the federal government wrote a blank check to the educational system by guaranteeing right. federal loans, and then also the fact that the government puts so many housing laws and zoning laws in place that it's impossible to build places for people to live if that's what you want to do with your business. So really, you look at these issues, and if you actually know what's going on, you know less government is the answer. And young people seem to think that socialism is like this just, this this wonderful system that's going to level the playing field and bring equality. But at the end of the day, it's the complete opposite. And all it does is really empower the corrupt people that make life harder for the working class in the first well, place. Just and, look and at it, Venezuela. You know. Founding father James Monroe warned way back in 1822 that federal spending ought to be limited to great national works. He said that if spending became relatively unlimited, it would be liable to waste and abuse. Well, here we are nearly 200 years later, and our tax dollars are spent on nearly anything and everything that our politicians deem fit. The budget is broken, at least in part, because politicians expect that we just won't pay attention, and oftentimes we don't. That's how we taxpayers get stuck subsidizing a $9,000 leather chair or $650,000 worth of golf carts, or how about $4 million worth of lobster and crabs? These are your hard-earned tax dollars. It's time to cut the wasteful spending. Now, I want to send a very clear message to Beto O'Rourke and every other Democrat that's trying to come after our guns. It's not happening. Not in this country. Right? Free people have a right to be able to defend themselves. And Beto was recently in Virginia telling people that he was going to confiscate our firearms. Well, I can tell Beto right now, if you want to try to confiscate some firearms, next time you're in the Commonwealth of Virginia, come by my house and give it a shot. Because I guarantee you that's not going to go down the way you think it will. And I also want to make sure that you understand you are the one perpetrating violence against innocent, law-abiding citizens when you tell them that you are going to use their sheriffs, their police officers to come in and confiscate their property and prevent them from being able to defend themselves. We're not the ones perpetuating violence. You are.